right. Um, Mary, do you want to get, should we get started now or, or give it a, a few more minutes for people to join us? What do, what do you want to do? Whatever you think. I'm, I'm uh, at your disposal right now. Let's give it, let's give it two more minutes. We usually give people till five after, but we've got a lot of people on already. So that means people are either early or we're going to have a big crowd. I'm not sure which, um, but we're now streaming over the YouTube. So anything you don't want the world to know, do not, do not say. <laughs> do not. Uh, do not it's not a good time to give out your bank code, social security <laughs> number, codes to the nuclear launch, any of those things. This Just in case I need a little more excitement. Yeah, well. If someone knows about Donald Trump's secret nuclear weapon program that wasn't the Washington Post today, they're welcome to share that with us. But uh, That's not so. the, that wasn't the, what was it, the it, it, it's buried in the middle of the story. The headline is about the COVID stuff, which obviously that's very shocking, but like in the middle of the story as an aside is like Donald Trump told Bob Woodward he had a secret nuclear weapons program that no one knows about it. It's never been done before. Bob Woodward asked Pentagon officials about that and they said they're shocked the president mentioned it and cannot say more other than that it exists and it's super secret. Uh, like and imagine the point in 2020 where like secret doomsday nuclear weapon program like doesn't even make the headline. It's like six <laughs> paragraphs in. Uh, that's um that's where we're at now. There was a Zizek book uh, in like 2011 or so called Living in End Times. And and now I think we truly yeah. are. You, I could be convinced, yeah. yeah. All right, let's stop talking about the end of the world and get started. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Chip Gibbons. I use he, him, his pronouns. I am with the Metro DC uh, Socialist, DSA Socialist Night School. We're really excited because tonight's Socialist Night School is being co-sponsored by the Northern Alabama Democratic Socialist of America as well. It's very sad that because of COVID, we no longer get to meet in person and see each other. But one upside is that we're able to bring people in from different parts of the country and come together. So we're having a joint session of both DC, DSA, and North Alabama. And our speaker is in Pennsylvania. Um, the topic tonight is the Communist Party of Alabama. And this session will be led by Mary Stanton. Stanton is the author of a number of books including uh, From Selma to Sara, The Life and Death of Yola Lizzo, as well as her most recent book, Red, White, Black, The Alabama Communist Party, 1930 to 1950. It is the first work on the American communist movement in the South since Robin D.G. Kelly's groundbreaking Hammer and Ho, and it's the first to explore its key actions beyond the 1930s. Stanton is a noted chronicler of the left and of social justice movements in the South. She has taught at the University of Idaho, the College of St. Elizabeth in New Jersey, and Rutgers University. We are super honored to have her tonight. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Mary. Thank you, Chip. Thank you very much. I've been looking forward uh, to tonight and the opportunity to discuss District 17 with you. And I do appreciate the interest of everybody who's uh, beamed in tonight. So for the first hour or so, I'd uh, like to provide some background and, and then we'll open up for discussion. But my intention is to focus on a number of things. The 1929 founding of District 17 in Birmingham, Alabama, and to explore the assignment these young Reds were given when they discovered, were given what they discovered when they arrived in Birmingham. And finally, I'd like to assess the work that they actually did because these were three very separate and individual themes. They were given an assignment. They discovered something they hadn't suspected when they got to Birmingham. And finally, there was the work that they did which really occupied my interest for the 10 years writing the book. Uh, they were, a fascinating group of people, motivated group of people. Uh, and the more I uncovered, the more I wanted to uncover. So we'll look at the challenges they faced, which were substantial because after all, they were young, they were white, 
and mostly from the Northeast and the Midwest of the country, and many were Jewish. I'll talk about the 1931 Scottsboro case, which became a game changer when it brought the international labor defense attorneys to Alabama. We'll evaluate the district's legacy. And finally, if time allows, I'd like to call your attention to what I've called the overarching influence of religion in everything Southern, it's rather grand. But any researcher of any aspect of Southern culture in any era, era inevitably bumps up against evangelical religion. So I think it's important to take a look at it uh, in regards to the South. And, and when I say any era, you can go back before the Civil War up to the day before yesterday, and you still have this consistent and interesting theme in, in Southern culture. So let's begin with District 17. The Communist Party of the United States of America was established in 1921 by the merger of the Communist Party, American Communist Party, and the Communist Labor Party. That year at the Third International Congress in Moscow, Chairman Lenin criticized the Americans for their failure to recruit significant numbers of African Americans. A Negro department was created to address the situation, but five years later, there were few signs of uh, any improvement. So in 1926, Harry Hayward, who was a young black American student at the Moscow School, was assigned to this Negro department. And he recommended that a quote, Negro, social, a Negro Soviet Socialist Republic be established in the South's Black Belt region. And that it be based on the Bolshevik policy of self-determination. African-Americans, Hayward said, was a subjugated people and therefore entitled to choose whether to remain part of the United States or to secede and create their own republic, effectively a nation within a nation. And so his recommendation was considered, it was passed, and black self-determination became party policy. Now the American Communist Party at that time was a Northern urban-based operation and it focused on labor organizing. So when you think about it, any plan for black self-determination would have to come from the South since urban blacks were pressing for integration at that time. The black belt policy would therefore take the American Reds into uncharted territory and uncharted territory it was. One year later in 1929, the, pod, the party established District 17 in Alabama, 90 miles north of the Black Belt region. Now this Black Belt we're talking about was farm country, rich alluvial soil, and it stretched from, the cent from central Alabama through Georgia and Mississippi. And District 17's jurisdiction included Alabama, Tennessee, and Georgia. But our focus today is on Alabama because that was the site where this Negro Republic was imagined. When the first comrades arrived in Birmingham, the Great Depression had already been underway for two years. Even though this was 1929, the Depression was giving the South a terrible time since 1927. The South was hit earlier and harder by economic devastation. And the district's biggest cities, Birmingham, Atlanta, and Chattanooga, were inundated by farmers, laborers, mill workers, and sharecroppers, all coming to seek work or shelter or relief. By 1929, Birmingham was overwhelmed by unemployment, homelessness, and starvation. And before the staff could think about pursuing black self-determination, they had to get busy establishing unemployed worker councils and organizing demonstrations to pressure state and local agencies like the Red Cross and the community chest to increase their aid. The median age of the District 17 staff was only 24 years. They were well-educated and ide idealistic, but none were native Southerners. 
They came from places like New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, Cleveland, and Boston. Some were second generation radicals whose parents had been associated with the labor movement. Three years later in 1932, a delegation of black Tallapoosa County sharecroppers arrived in Birmingham and went to headquarters to request assistance with organizing a union, the Alabama Sharecroppers Union. Their demands were simple, they were clear and direct. Number one, they wanted to market their own crops instead of going through furnished merchants who worked for the planters. They wanted payment for the harvest in cash rather than credit from the plantation store. They wanted the ability to deal directly with banks and local merchants rather than having every transaction go through the planters. And they wanted an increase in an, the hourly rate for pickers and croppers. Those were the day laborers. They also wanted, and this becomes an issue a bit later on, they wanted release of the Scottsboro boys who became a powerful symbol of black suffering in the South. And we're gonna to get to that a little later, but I read so in one, it may have been uh, Professor Kelly's book that Scottsboro became such a, uh, an icon of suffering in the South that many of the sharecroppers saw the release of the Scottsboro boys right up there with creating the union and getting their own justice uh, with regards to their uh, agricultural output. So it was a very, very important issue. Throughout the process of union organizing, however, organizing with these black sharecroppers, the Reds were finally able to introduce their black belt policy. And this was three years after they arrived uh, in Alabama. However, the response that they got was not what they'd expected. The black croppers were not interested in, in seceding or in establishing any independent republic or in becoming a nation within a nation. They asked, this is interesting, they asked, how is that any different from segregation? They wanted to become a functioning part of American society and they wanted their fair share of the nation's wealth. Therefore, by 1933, the, district, the district's priorities had become organizing unemployed workers, which they had not expected, workers like miners and mill workers in Birmingham and black sharecroppers in the rural districts, and in protesting police brutality and systemic racism within the South's justice and judicial systems, an old issue that we're still struggling with today. So what were some of their ongoing challenges over these first uh, three years? Well, white Southerners saw District 17 as a threat to their political, economic, and social stability. It was an, at an attack on their way of life, which had been based on white privilege for generations. The Reds were declared, and I quote, integration preaching atheists and anarchists because of their anti-lynching, anti-segregation and pro-social justice positions, the staff suffered the full frontal attack by police, prosecutors, judges, and planters. Within the first six years that they were in Birmingham, they experienced five lynchings, two riots, and two brutal labor strikes within the jurisdiction. If you can imagine, the district operated like a firehouse in a constant state of emergency fueled by adrenaline. Every crisis demanded immediate attention and crises often overlapped. They triage, they improvise, they rush themselves and others out back doors, out windows and into cars to get to safety. They called public meetings, planned and led demonstrations, bailed comrades out of jail and just kept moving. There were no second shifts to hand off follow-up and the environment was uniformly hostile. Organizers were constantly being transferred in and out of Birmingham and there were never enough of them. 
And then there were the Scottsboro trials. Scottsboro case broke in March, 1931, when nine black teens were arrested in Paint Rock, Alabama and charged with raping two white women. All had been hitching in open freight cars, which was a violation of um, Tennessee state law and Alabama state law. When a group of white boys encountered a group of black teens, a fight broke out over who was going to be tossed off the train. All were hitching from Chattanooga to Memphis in search of work. Nine young black men were ultimately arrested. Two young white women, Victoria Price and Ruby Bates, were held as material witnesses. They were on probation for prostitution. If they were charged with vag vagrancy, like the black surely would be, the women would be sent back to jail. When the sheriff asked if the black boys had, quote, bothered them, Victoria Price made a fateful decision. Yes, she said, they had. And Ruby Bates agreed. In the space of four days, four all-white, all-male juries convicted eight of the nine defendants of rape, and they were sentenced to death. The youngest received a life sentence. The Scottsboro case was a game changer because it brought the international labor defense, the legal arm of the party, to Alabama. The IDL had been established in 1925 as a legal advo advo advocacy, I'm trouble with that word, legal advocacy organization, four years before the district. Its mission was to de defend political prisoners, famously Sacco and Benzetti. IDL attorneys defended the international workers of the world, the Wobblies, against ongoing charges of sabotage, violence, and terrorism. But this was in the field of labor organizing. When they came to Alabama, the IDL attorneys demanded stays of execution for the Scottsboro boys. And they appealed for new trials based on the incompetence of their original counsel. They also crafted national and international campaigns to protest legal lynching. Now, jurors who engaged in legal lynching were willing to accept evidence, any evidence or none at all, to send black defenders to the defendants to their death. The Scottsboro trials were classic examples of legal lynching. The ILD demonstrated against their arrest and launched, launched a massive national publicity campaign to keep these young men's faces on the front pages of the American press simply to keep them alive. The ILD came in and took charge of the Scottsboro appeals. No other organization, black or white, initially assisted the boys. The NAACP was a latecomer. But to be fair uh, to the NAACP, Walter White, who became uh, national director that year, was only at his position a couple of months when the Scottsboro case broke. He reported to a, a biracial um, board who were very ambivalent about whether or not to take on the Scottsboro case to defend these young men. You had people on the board saying, well, what if they actually did the crime? Where would that leave the reputation of the NAACP? So Walter White, as most, most of you know, I'm sure you know, was a black man who did have the physical appearance of a white man. And he was, that often became confusing, but that's what it was. At the same time, William Patterson, who was in charge of the ILD, also a black man, was also new to his position. He had been uh, chairman of the ILD or a manager of the ILD for less than a year. So you had these two new, very ambitious, very dedicated uh, men who engage in ongoing animosity with their organizations. 
since they disagreed so violently on basic defense strategies. The NAACP preferred to work behind the scenes with white allies, while the ILD engaged in all out confrontation. And so it was that the Scottsboro boys ultimately chose the ILD attorneys uh, to defend them. The ILD's work with the Scottsboro boys was a major motivating factor in the acceptance of the Alabama Communist Party among Southern Blacks and the resulting surge in the number of Black communists in Alabama. So who were these uh, Black communists? Well, while Black novelist uh, Zora Hill Neil Hurston maintained that by and large African Americans did not buy into communism, in Alabama, many Black men and women considered their Reds to be a very different breed of cat. The district Reds impressed them with their willingness to publicly stand up to white authority and by their unwavering and again public commitment to social justice. By 1934, the Alabama Communist Party's membership was 95% black. And by that time it had reached 1000 members. This was a factor of several things. Number one, the determination of the district's unemployed workers councils. The ILD's handling of the Scottsboro of but borough appeals and the party's campaign for racial equality. The district's actions spoke louder than words. When the Reds opposed segregation, they not only advocated for economic equality, but they demonstrated for equal pay for equal work. That was extraordinary in the South in the 1930s. It was extraordinary across the country um, when young black men like Harry Hayward, Angelo Herndon, Al Murphy, and Hosea Hudson joined the party, they were groomed for leadership positions. Herndon later wrote, quote, we were called comrades without condescension or patronage. We were treated like equals and brothers. Many black women led Birmingham unemployed worker councils. They organized, they recruited, they demonstrated, and they confronted state and local agencies, especially the Birmingham Red Cross for its disrespect, its disrespectful treatment of the poor. Many of these women were arrested, beaten, and jailed because of their actions. The majority of black communists were semi-literate and devout Christians. Their understanding of exploitation and oppression was scripture based and they considered the Reds quote, righteous men and women. The party gave black people in Alabama a sense of dignity, which the black middle class, including the NAACP often denied them. And what about the, the district's legacy? Most people have never heard, didn't I find out, of District 17 uh, in Alabama. Didn't know that there was a, such a strong movement in Alabama that it was mostly black. And certainly didn't know that it was spearheaded by a group of very young comrades who had never, most who had never been in the South before who had grown up in the North and in major cities. But District 17 in the end provided a model of interracial coalition building and direct action at SNCC and CORE, the SDS, the SCLC, and the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights employed. Like District 17, later social justice movements called out the contradictions between the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, and the Southern way of life. They challenged America's apathy concerning poverty and injustice by protesting, demonstrating, and appealing directly to national and international audiences. 
1951, the Civil Rights Congress, which was the successor to the ILD, charged the United States with genocide based on the Geneva Convention definition of genocide. By the way, this um, Civil Rights Congress was led uh, by William Patterson, the, uh, the first secretary of the ILD in the South. In the 1960s, SNCC developed local black leaders in the South as the district had Alabama's Black Panther policy, uh, Black Panther Party an outgrowth of SNCC continued the struggle for economic justice for Alabama's black farmers and sharecroppers into the 1960s. In 21st century movements like Occupy, the Sanders Revolution, Black Lives Matter, and the present day pushback against police brutality fueled by the murder of George Floyd and so many others continue to echo the ILD's in your face activism. They've succeeded in putting socialism back on the American agenda. Mary, are you still there? Hey everyone, uh, this is Chip Gibbons. As some of you have noted, the screen is frozen and it looks like Mary has dropped. I apologize, I'm gonna try to fix this now. Um, Yeah, that's a, a good suggestion. She should exit and rejoin. I don't, I don't see where she's rejoined though. David, are you there? I'm here. So, um, looks like, uh, do you have anything about future DSA events you want to talk about while I try to get Mary back on or, you know, ad lib or, or something? I can tell you that, um, we have one event coming up. We don't have it scheduled exactly yet, but it's going to be on the Brazilian um, landless workers movement. We're going to have some folks, some comrades from locally um, who know about this, as well as some um, comrades from Brazil that are going to call in. So we're going to do a panel. Um, we're very excited for that. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a date yet, um, but hopefully soon. And then soon after that, I think we're going to restart and so we're going to have me, this is David Kibe, um, doing our um, What is Socialism event. And then we're going to have Chip going for uh, our introduction to socialism. And it looks like we got Mary back. Mary back. Uh, but you, you're going to need to promote her, Chip. Uh, she's a panelist. At make, I'll make her a co-host. Yeah. Mary, are you back? This is this is just got back. Yes, I lost uh, everything. Just cut out. I got. Uh, we were talking about William Patterson. Yes, and we charged genocide. Yes, that's right. That's where we were. Welcome back. Let me see. Was that? Yeah. Oh, 
Okay. And I think uh, I was going, did we come to uh, the district's legacy? Did we get that far? We were discussing the ILD in Scottsboro and you had mentioned that William Patterson was involved in the civil rights Congress's We Charge Genocide petition. And that's, David, did we get to anything beyond that? I think that's where we stopped. Yep. I think that's where we lost you. Yeah. That's fine. There was a brief moment where I wasn't sure if my computer was frozen or, or you were frozen. And then. And then, a, and then a black screen. And then a black screen. Yes. That is what happened. Okay. So, okay. So he, the 1951 Civil Rights Congress, the successor to the ID, ILD, the genocide, uh, that charged the United States with genocide based on the Geneva Convention. Uh, definition of genocide. Okay, that's good. Uh, in the 1960s, SNCC developed local black leaders in the South and uh, as the district had, Alabama's Black Panther Party and outgrowth of, this, of SNCC continued the struggle for economic justice for Alabama's black farmers and sharecroppers in the 1960s. 21st century movements like Occupy the Sanders Revolution, Black Lives Matter, and the present day pushback against police brutality fueled by the murder of George Floyd and so many others continue to echo the ILDs in your face activism. They have succeeded in putting socialism back on the American agenda. District 17's legacy is all about its groundbreaking contributions to the ongoing work of building a more decent America. So I'd like to complete my presentation um, by providing, as I mentioned, some insight into the power of evangelical Christianity in Southern culture. Um, so what I wanna do is share a short, and I mean short, four page chapter from my book, Red, Black, White, entitled An All-Purpose Jesus, before we open up for discussion. Here we go. Um, an all-purpose Jesus. I begin with a quotation from Flannery O'Connor. I think it is safe to say that while the South is hardly Christ-centered, it is most certainly Christ-haunted. Most of the young Reds who found their way to Birmingham in the 1930s knew a lot about economics, philosophy, and political theory, but not much about organized religion which Karl Marx defined as the, quote, sigh of the oppressed creatures, the heart of a heartless world, and the soul of soulless con conditions. While he distrusted religion, Marx never advocated abolishing it. He hoped to structure a society in which people would simply no longer need it. While he believed that religion did not change anything, Marx understood that it could be used to manipulate people, to invest their hopes, in some imaginary future in order to relieve present suffering. Communism, on the other hand, offered a rational path to solving the problems of this world. The District 17 Reds would quickly learn, however, just how central a role religion, specifically Christianity, played in the Southern way of life. It resonated with sharecroppers, black and white, and was equally essential to middle-class and affluent whites who often shaped it to justify and defend white supremacy. Southern religion so rife with contradiction and paradox served needs at all levels and had to be accommodated. Black sharecroppers and tenant farmers who had no political or economic power and very little education often found consolation in Bible stories about Hebrew slaves escaping their captors in the social justice tirades of Old Testament prophets and in the Beatitudes of Jesus. The prophet Amos assured them that God's first concern was justice, and Jesus spoke of a time when social order would be upended, when the first will be last, and many who are last shall be first. Their Jesus was not the red-haired, blue-eyed son of God that the planters worshiped on Sunday mornings. That one didn't offer consolation, but then the planters didn't need it. They were already masters of the temporal world. 
the teachings of their gentle Jesus, meek and mild, seemed even to them more relevant to Sunday school students. They preferred the more robust St. Paul and his practical advice concerning social equality, beginning with his instruction to slaves to obey their masters. But this white planter's Jesus, like the Jesus of the black cropper, delivered eternal salvation through the grace of God, and that was serious. Whites believe that while God determined a person's station at birth, making some blessed, like themselves, and others not so much, the gift of salvation evened everything out in the end. Anyone's soul could be saved at any time. In God's kingdom, God made things right. This became the first level of defense of segregation from a Christian point of view. Croppers black and white were generally evangelicals who believed that the Bible was the literal word of God and that salvation was his gift through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. Black evangelicals tended to understand salvation as both a future event and as the working out of God's kingdom through collective action right here on earth. While evangelicals, however, stress salvation's individual benefit, white e evangelicals, sorry, white evangelicals, however, stress salvation's individual benefit, the saving of one's soul. Both black and white evangelicals recognized baptism by the Holy Spirit. This manifested whenever a believer became so filled with God's spirit that he or she received gifts of ministry, such as understanding tongues, interpreting prophecy and healing the sick. Evangelical worship service, black or white, were lively, energetic testaments. The Jesus of the poor white farmer, hardly meek and mild, was a working man, a carpenter with faith so strong that he could drive out demons. He promised that with enough faith, others could do the same. But first, one had to be saved. Unless you were born again, spiritually transformed, you were not eligible to receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Thankfully, being saved or giving your life over to Jesus was a once and for all time event. The image of Jesus in the South and likely elsewhere was often a projection of the believer's own heart and mind. As white Southern Christians strained to align the gospel with the Southern way of life, black Christians reflected on the same text and found encouragement, if not deliverance. Black croppers worshiped in small congregations led by men and women who've been called to preach rather than ordained. Like white croppers, they look forward to visits by itinerant preachers who conducted outdoor revival meetings where many neighbors, family members, and friends recommitted themselves to the Lord. In the minds of many black croppers, Jesus was akin to a trickster who defined convention, who defied convention by challenging and destabilizing authority. He could be counted on to make a way where there was no way. This Jesus walked beside folks every day, helping them stay one step ahead of the boss, the landlord or the sheriff. He never promised God would remove the inequities of life, only that he would provide strength to cope with them. That hopeful spirit often spilled over into sharecropper union meetings to create a revival-like atmosphere. The next section is called the social gospel. The progressive social gospel tradition was revived during the depression, largely by white ministers whose radical vision of Jesus had cost them their pulpits. These men envision, envisioned Jesus as a prophet who was just as concerned with justice for the living as he was with caring for the souls of the dead. Because they recognized many of Jesus' teachings as compatible with socialism, they called themselves Christian socialists. Howard Kester, a white ex-Presbyterian minister who worked for the Pacifist Fellowship of Reconciliation, was radicalized in 1933 during relief operations with striking coal miners in Wilder, Tennessee. His decision to align with those miners, who in their desperation began to fight violence with violence, cost him his job. But Kester concluded that, quote, to attempt to emancipate the mass of white and Negro workers in the South, employed in mine, mill, farm, and factory only through the method of goodwill, moral suasion, and education, 
is to invite continued exploitation, misery and suffering of generations yet unknown. Kester's change of heart literally changed the course of his life. He later became chaplain of the Southern Tenant Farmers Union. Kester's experience was not unique. Preachers black and white made some of the most effective leaders of the sharecropper and tenant farmer movement. Both the Southern Tenant Farmers Union and the Alabama Sharecroppers Union held their meetings in churches and used Bible readings, prayer and hymn singing to celebrate their solidarity. Every meeting opened with a prayer and closed with a blessing. Well-educated Protestant clergymen, seminary trained Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians and Episcopalians were not immune to the temptation to manipulate the image of Jesus in defense of, quote, Christian segregation. In 1966, Kyle Hazelton, editor of Christian Century, accused them of preaching the ethicless gospel, gospel, the ethicless gospel, to preserve their religion while making it serve the basis of interest. They eliminated the hard judgmental imperatives of the faith, Hazelton wrote. Truth and justice were pushed out but the lesser merits of church going, Bible reading, courtesy and hospitality remained. They kept evang evangelic and mission fervor, ritualistic rel religious acts and sentiments, and this gave them a warm glow of personal righteousness. They were for all intents and purposes, cultural Christians. While some clergymen disdain Christian segregation as an oxymoron, that was impossible to accept, let alone explain, others more easily incorporated it into their religious experience. It tended to make their lives easier and often enhanced their careers. Not to be outdone, the Ku Klux Klan exploited Jesus' elasticity. Church membership was required of all the Knights and the 1924 Imperial Wizard H.W. Evans, a former Methodist minister, wrote, quote, as the star of Bethlehem guided the wise man to Christ, so it is that the clan is expected to guide men to the right life under Christ's banner. Jesus the Klansman was the New Testament Jesus who had outwitted and humiliated the high priests and Pharisees. Klansman W.C. Wright, writing for the Imperial Nighthawk, glorified him as, quote, the model Klansman because he sought, first of all, to deliver the people of his own race, blood and religion, and he emerged from the Jewish clan to create his own. While all Christians put their faith in Jesus and in the hope of eternal salvation, it was sometimes difficult for outsiders to determine which Jesus they were talking about and what kind of salvation they were referring to. Klansmen were only the most obvious among those who conflated salvation with white's privilege. Many white Christians despise the Reds for their atheism or simply for being Jewish. The term communist covered both bases. The communist rejection of Jesus compounded by their radical politics was an affront to the Southern way of life. To their credit, the Reds accepted that there were needs that only religion could satisfy. Christianity was indispensable in the South, whether in its evangelical, Pentecostal, conservative, or liberal manifestation. It held rich, poor, and middle-class black, blacks and whites, segregationists and Klansmen all in thrall. Jesus spoke to all of them, albeit in different contexts and in different ways. Many Reds, if they had to identify, would probably consider themselves cultural Jews. Most were children of Eastern European immigrants who worked at blue collar jobs or taught school, labored in factories or ran small businesses. Some of their parents had emigrated because of their own unpopular beliefs. They'd learned Torah and Talmud traditions at home, including the concept of tikkun olam, a requirement to make an effort to repair the world. For them, action would always be more important than belief. Many had been drawn to the Communist Party because of, its, because of its moral toughness, because of its Negro work and anti-racist commitment. As journalist Daniel Oppenheimer notes, belief is complicated, contingent, multi-determined. It is hard to be a person in the world, period. And how much more confusing that task can become 
when you take on responsibility for repairing or redeeming. Now let's open to discussion, questions, comments, whatever you're. Sure. So if people have a question, there's a Q&A box at the bottom. Uh, please type it in there and I will get to it and I will read it. I guess I'll start though with, with a question. I will abuse my moderator's privilege. You, you mentioned sort of that the legacy of District 17 can be seen in movements like Occupy and Black Lives Matter and Sanders. Obviously we are at a time in this country where there is great economic inequality, renewed labor militancy, as well as sort of the continuous struggle against white supremacy and against police brutality, all issues that the communists in Alabama dealt with. What would you say were the lessons of the Communist Party of Alabama for activists today, especially on how you deal with issues of, of race and, and class in the United States? Issues of race and class? Yeah. Well, I, I think this, as I said, many of the strategies that they uh, tested in the South um, were helpful to them. And I think part of the legacy is the delivering and the um, working on those strategies. Um, unfortunately, it's hard to see where a breakthrough is going to come. I mean, we've been dealing with um, racial issues and issues of inequality, um, especially system, at least systemic, the, the idea of systemic racism is now in our vocabulary. It's been around for a very long time. The, the communists didn't invent it, but it, it's this constant cycle um, and I get a little, um, you know, depressed myself with not seeing a great deal of change. Um, I am very much uh, hopeful because of the the, the spirit of uh, these new movements, uh, especially uh, Black Lives Matter and um, the Sanders uh, Revolution. Um, We've got a. We're saying a lot of the same things, um, but you've got to get over the hump of how that's going to be actualized. How that's going to actual, and um, I don't have. I don't have an answer for it. Uh, it's it's been a drumbeat for a very very long time. I hate to be the bearer of bad news. No, no, <laughs> I don't. I don't think anyone has an answer to that one. The fact that so many of these issues from the from the 30s that the communists were confronting still seem relevant suggest that if someone had an answer, we would have heard it by now, but it's just always interesting to think. But it's, they stepped out, they stepped out and into it. They didn't know what they were stepping into and they stayed there and they worked hard. And, um, you know, I think there's, there's a lot of um, admiration I have for them for having done so that. We've got a lot of questions about religion, actually. Yes. Uh, Allison asked, how did the communist district organizers respond to the religion of the South? Were they able to use it to reach the sharecroppers? Did their response change from the third period to the popular front and then to the post-war period? And I'm not sure if everyone watching knows the distinction between the third period and popular front. Yeah, well, um, I, I basically focused on, you know, the, the period when these, um, this group came to establish themselves in Alabama. In Alabama. Um, there wasn't a great deal of trying to work with the church because I think that was basically impossible. Um, again, it was it was un, unknown territory. The, the, what had happened was that because the um, the black the black population, especially the sharecroppers, saw this group as being positive, they welcomed them in. I mean, they, they took uh, the party in. They wanted to become uh, members of the party. And so there, if there was any, um, if there was any actual uh, give and take b 
between the you know the residents of Alabama and the uh, the communists it w it was going the opposite way it was coming up uh, rather than being pushed down uh, by the communists and um, religion religion was helpful in creating this this uh, uh, party but it was also the which is why it fascinates me so much. It was also what helped to destroy it, to get rid of them from, uh, from Alabama. Because um, the Christian religion in all its iterations uh, was so splintered that um, it became, it, you know, for the black population, something positive and for many others, not so positive. I hope that answered, I'm, I'm not so sure. I'm not sure I answered that question, but religion in the South has fascinated me for a very, very long time. That's, that, that sort of leads into to the next question, but just, just quickly to clarify, since the question mentioned third period and popular front, the third period was a period in the Communist International where they were quite uh, sectarian and unwilling to work with more unwilling to work with other groups, whereas during the Popular Front, the communists did a lot of building out of. So people who are, do not, not know those terms, don't worry. If you're deep in the weeds of like communist history, they're, they're more well known, but just to clarify what the questioner was, was talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, so one, Lawrence wants to know, does Christian fundamentalism play the same role today in blocking activism? Blocking activism? Blocking activism, yes. Um. Yeah, I think in in, the, in our divided um, political um, environment, it, it certainly does. Um, religion has become politicized in a way that it wasn't um, even in its least helpful years uh, during the communist movement in Alabama. But now being politicized, it seems to me to have been taken a step further uh, away. Uh, what is fascinating to me is how one justifies one's uh, calling oneself a Christian. I mean, if you, if you re actually read the New Testament and the Sermon on the Mount, you've got you know, a bunch of things that one ought to at least give a salute to. And you don't find that um, it becomes again a way to manipulate the situation we have in our country very clearly that you have a person who is our president who's being hailed by some on the extreme right as a savior, as a someone who has come to deliver the country. And you know, on the on the left, you've got something quite different. So it. I think that it it remains a very divisive part of our our um, culture. Um, hasn't gotten any better in all of these years, and I think with the politis, politis, politicalization of it, um, we're in many ways in a worse situation when it comes to trying to think about how to bring us together um, when dealing you know, with religion as it works for us. And that leads right into the next question. Uh, an anonymous attendee asked, I speak as a religious person, Muslim. What do you suggest as an organizing strategy to come up against the religious right with a religious socialist left? And I don't know if that's outside the scope of your... Well, it, it probably is because I, I, I can't even imagine you have some fundamentalist who you can't even engage in a conversation with. You know, I'm I'm pretty political myself. I don't like somebody talking to me about changing my mind, but at least I can listen to a conversation. But you've got this politicalization of religion at this point where it's, you've got no path. You've got no path to come in and deal with it. Um, it you know, if the ideal is to deal with it and that is a good ideal, how do you approach someone whose mind is so closed? 
Um, and that's, that, to me, that's a very frightening aspect uh, of it. So as I said, that the last four questions, I don't know. I don't have an answer to that. I, I wish I did. Um, I think we're, we're in stall mode as a culture right now. And um, something's got to give on one side or the other, or maybe a little bit on both sides. So there are, there are quite a few questions still about religion, but I'm going to shift gears for a minute. Uh, my co-organizer, David, asked, uh, what did the organizers do to combat white chauvinism amongst white Alabamans? White chauvinism, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, white supremacy? Yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, they lived with it. Mm. What could they do about it? Um, So another anonymous question is, can you comment on the relevance of the right to national self-determination to the struggle for socialism and black liberation today? Uh, the questioner notes that this was a formulation that was adopted by some groups in the new communist movement in the 1970s, even though the demographics had shifted. For people who are not familiar with the new communist movement, that's a term that's used to refer to a number of groups in the 70s that in the US that come out of sort of, I guess, in part, the student movement and other adjacent movements that embrace a sort of Marxist Leninist Maoist doctrine. And a number of those groups revived the question of self determination in the black belt. Um, what does the right to self determination mean, if not national self determination? Is this an important principle to uphold? Well, I think I think it, it is an important uh, an important determination. But what struck me, and I had no understanding of this be before, that what the party saw realistically and honestly as a, uh, a people who were who needed self-determination because they were as they were a nation within a nation uh, in the black belt and i think it was idealistically and intellectually probably a very good theory but when they got down there to operationalize it the the, the surprise was that these sharecroppers did, didn't want it they didn't want to do it. They didn't want to be separate. Separate meant segregation to them. And what they wanted was a piece of the pie. I mean, really Americans, I, that's what they wanted. They wanted some of the, the good things of, of the society. And so what you have is do you separate and uh, follow a, a program of self-determination? You probably can if you can get the resources that you need um, to, to allow it. So you have the choice, as you always have the choice, to either stay and fight or remove and, and create something new. And I think there's something to be said uh, for either. So Joy wants to know, what did you learn about the role of women in Communist Party organizing? Well, I learned um, there were, there were few women in the uh, communist organizers who came in 1929. What I did look at was the role of women in the black communist, uh, when the party was pre predominantly black. And these were some of the best organizers. There was a, a young woman who uh, was of, of the family of Tommy Gray, who was one of the uh, Alabama sharecropper uh, union organizers. And when he was killed, uh, his daughter for a time took over uh, the meeting, the, uh, the role of leader of the uh, union. Um, but she was replaced um, by the party and the role seems very analogous to what happened in, in the SDS, in SNCC, and in a lot of other organizations, that they were kind of pushed, no matter how hard they worked, pushed to the, the borders um, and kept 
in roles um, like the uh, unemployed council movements and working for aid in, in Birmingham. So I think that was pretty much across the board. Um, I didn't see much difference as time went on. Um, it was a male, um, it was a male effort, I, I would have to say. And uh, they found, women found their places uh, to work where they could be effective and they picked up uh, some of the edges of, of the movement. One of the things that's always interested me has been how widespread traction the movement to free the Scottsboro Boys got, not just in Alabama, but in the U.S. North and beyond the U.S. It was very much a, a global movement. I, I think there are reports that in Spain, in Republican Spain, during, during the Civil War, people were having rallies to free the Scottsboro Boys. I know one of the mothers went on an international speaking tour. What do you think it was about the Scottsboro case that was so able to captivate a, a national and international audience? Was it something particularly harrowing about the details or was it a, a strategy that the international labor defense used? I think it was both. I think that um, the ILD came on like gangbusters and burst, they burst onto the scene and they weren't going to hold any prisoners. They were going to attack the whole idea of uh, racism and white supremacy uh, more than anything. And it caught on because what you had were, as you said, the mothers who, um, who campaigned uh, with the ILD. Um, and you had the one trial after another trial, after an appeal, after appeal, they came, uh, they appealed all the way up to the Supreme Court. And you had these young men, the last one I believe came out of jail in the 1950s. Um, and you had Ruby Bates saying, at some point in one of the um, appeals, she said that it never happened. The rape never happened. And at the time they said, okay, the how can you appeal anything? The trial is over. One of the witnesses, uh, one of the um, claimants has said that it never happened. I mean, Ruby Bates became quite active with the movement to defend the Scottsboro Boys. She did. She traveled with them. And they used that against her at, at one of the subsequent trials, I think, when, when she testified. The prosecution asked her a bunch of questions like, who paid for your hat? And she answered to the communists, who paid for your new clothes and, and things like that. There's a PBS documentary when I taught a high school class on criminal procedure, if you can imagine me having done that. I used to always show them the, the um, PBS documentary on the Scottsboro Boys and they, they recreate some of the cross-examination of, of Ruby Bates in the, I believe it is second trial. What was the ultimate outcome for the Scottsboro Boys? Well, some, some were released, um, pardoned. Um, By George Wallace, right? Yes, George Wallace, four people. And um, one, escaped prison and uh, had a life under his brother's name and then eventually were pardoned. Uh, there were some tragic stories. One, um, one of the younger ones uh, left uh, prison. He was, um, you know, he, I believe he was pardoned, but he joined the army he got married. It looked like he was putting a good life together. And he came back and found that his wife was being unfaithful to him. And he yeah. killed her and himself. And it just, they couldn't seem to get any traction. One or two went back home if they had families left. Um, there was one who was, um, he was, I guess you would call him today, um, wasn't retarded, but he was, you know, low intelligence. And 
nobody knows what happened to him. He walked away from prison. I mean, they were these lives that were uh, interrupted. I think the oldest of them was 19 years old. And um, with Ruby Bates going around with the Scottsboro mothers and um, the ILD taking one of the mothers to, to Russia, um, you had the whole, Germany was very uh, involved in the, and I think it was a, a terrible um, look at the United States that they couldn't, South could not let go of this case. They insisted that the boys got a, a fair trial from the beginning. They insisted that they did it. They insisted that white uh, Southern women, uh, you know, were victims and would never have had any kind of relations with black men unless they were forced. And it was just, it brought out everything that um, seemed to be wrong with the society at that point. But um, none of them still were yeah. though. So in that sense- No, no, none of them, but they lost their lives inside. Uh, they were given, there was one, um, Hayward Patterson, who was the surliest of them, and he would get the uh, the detail that had to uh, pick up the bodies mm -hmm. from uh, from the electric chair and clean up that room. I mean, they they were they were terribly uh, treated in in jail, and they were just held in in contempt. Um, it was a very very tragic story. So so Jarrett says to. to to move notes for a minute. Uh, you mentioned farmers and sharecroppers quite often, justifiably so, as part of the Alabama Communist Party movement. However, in light of the urbanization of Alabama, especially Birmingham and Hunts Huntsville, the farming communities are becoming more sparse. What successes did this Alabama CP have in cities specifically, and what lessons could be drawn from their attempts to organize in more urban areas? Well, I, I think the fact that they went deeply into the communities that they worked with, they tried to understand what the needs were and didn't try to provide them, but to try to build um, resources within the communities to have the communities respond uh, to the best of their ability themselves. I mean, it was really classic organizational um, procedure. Um, the difference that, well, the difference was it, it was a, a good deal like today, uh, when you think about it in the Great Depression, this, the uh, economy was flat. Uh, everybody needed something. And um, I think that if we dig, there are lessons to be learned. Uh, Today, although we are a different society, I think um, although we haven't lost our anger around some of these issues, um, and that's not to this question, but it's something that occurs to me all the time that this this anger has never dissipated; that it keeps cycling back, um, whether it's through Black Lives Matter or through um, King's Movement or. Um, we deal with the same issues over and over and over again. Mary, you've written a lot about social justice movements in the South, several books. Uh, Dylan asked, uh, what does the future of the left in the South look like to you? What does what, I'm sorry? The future of the left in the South look like to you? I am mostly familiar. I spent most of my um, days um, when I was writing these books in Alabama, specifically Montgomery and Birmingham. And I did meet um, many people who were in the, in the liberal South. Um, it's a strong enough movement to have elected uh, a democratic Senator, whether he gets reelected or not is any, anybody's guess, but um, is there a, a distinction? 
I can't even say that I think with regards to, to, to race that one section of the country understands the issue better or has a better handle on it as it, it manifests in so many different ways in urban and suburban and in uh, rural areas. Um, my experience was that the, the liberal South was more center liberal uh, than, than I've experienced uh, growing up and living in the Northeast all my life. Um, but it's difficult to draw a, a distinction, I think, for me anyway, that would have really any relevance. <laughs> So it, it's it's interesting me. So you grew up in the Northeast all your life. You've written three books on on the U.S. South. What what drew you to the U.S. South as a topic of historical inquiry? Well, the first one I wrote was uh, uh, from Selma to Sorrow. It was the biography of Viola Liuzzo, and she was the woman who was killed in the 1965 voting rights march. She was she was murdered, and um, I never forgot about her. I was 19 when it happened. And um, when I started looking at that story 20 years after that, I found out that she was from the South, although at the time of her death, she was living in Detroit and she was considered to be a Northerner. But she had grown up in the South. And um, I think her st story kind of galvanized me and it brought me to Alabama specifically um, to Selma where I did a, a major amount of research and in Detroit as well. And it, it, it captured my imagination that here was a middle-class white woman, not unlike my mother um, who did this, went down to march in the voting rights uh, march to get this bill passed and in pursuit of voting rights and to march with, with Dr. King. And as some of you, you may remember, she was absolutely vilified at the time that she was murdered. Uh, why would a woman do that? Why would a woman leave her five children to go on a March uh, for voting rights. Um, one extraordinary story was she went down there so she could sleep with black men as if there were no black men in Detroit. Um, if that's what she had, you know, wanted to do. And that, when I was 19 years old, really shook me. Um, the fact that I, how free was I to do anything that I wanted to do if this was what the outcome would be of a woman doing anything. Anyway, that's, that was the long story about the route that took me to um, Alabama, specifically to Selma. And uh, the other books followed as I worked in the, uh, in the archives. Um, the stories, Alabama's got the best stories, they've got the best history for someone who is fascinated uh, by history because it's got everything uh, in it. And, and that's a very harrowing story. And if people, the book is called From Selma to Sorrow, The Life and Death of Viola Leozo. And I've been, I've been reading up on, on that story for something else I work on. It's very harrowing. We have a question from one of our comrades in North Alabama, Tristan, that sort of covers some of the ground you've already talked about. But he says, here in North Alabama, there is still a big difference in the Christianity practiced by the black and white communities. However, mm -hmm. all the other self-described communists I've met here are secular and white. Our chapter has spoken about allying with local churchgoers who share our political aims, but the difference in worldview seems like a large obstacle to solidarity and recruitment. He asked, how should we begin building bridges there. And I, I know you've said to some of these similar questions, you don't know the, the answer, but how did the Communist Party in the 30s work around getting around those different differences? Well, they worked because the, the work 
to do the problems that had to be solved were problems that were common whether you were religious or not religious whether you were a member of a church or a member of the community it be, it became a problem when the the communists were constantly being attacked for their atheism uh, for the Jewishness in some cases and the focus they tried to keep the focus on the problems of unemployment the problems of hunger the problems of poverty um, what some of these young people were doing in Birmingham was going and linking up the electricity after the electric company shut it off for mm -hmm. entire groups of, of, of uh, poor, black and white poor neighborhoods. So I think that sometimes, and I may be very wrong in this, I think that sometimes our focus gets lost in trying to solve the unsolvable. Um, you're, you know, I was I grew up in the Methodist Church, and all I heard for years and years was how to build bridges, how to build bridges. We're going to build this bridge. We're going to build that bridge. We're going to have. In my experience, it didn't happen. The most um, gratifying and the most productive of the projects that we had was figuring out what physically needed to be done, figuring out how to get from A to B to get people fed, to get them clothed, to put them in school. Um, and that's my best answer to that. I, you know, um, maybe it's my age, but I'm no longer interested in running, chasing shadows when I don't have much faith in, in the process of getting anything changed on, on a different kind of level. It, it sounds to me like the a way to build bridges then is the sort of shared material struggle, right? That yeah. if we're both hungry and we, we fight for, for food, then the fact that one person is, is a Methodist and the other is a Baptist and the third is, is a communist maybe makes less difference in, in that moment than that they're hungry. That I don't know if you agree with that or not, but that is. Yes, I do. And then the memory of that activity, I think, builds in some way, the, at least the beginning of a bridge, because how are you, you know, what, what is it that you're looking at in building a bridge? It's getting people together. And if nothing gets them together, like putting them to work. And I think that really is, people always wonder how is the Communist Party as successful as it was in the 1930s, not just in Alabama, but, but elsewhere. I, I think that really is ultimately the answer is that they, they saw people who had needs, whether it was they were unemployed and they were going to be evicted or they were unemployed and needed relief or they were auto workers and needed a union or they were the Scottsboro boys and they were, they were on death row and they actually brought people together to struggle for, for concrete victories in, in those, in those fights. Well, um, even, even the experience of the ILD and the NAACP in butting their heads together for, for a year before the, the uh, Scottsboro boys was sorted out and, and went with the ILD to defend them. But they, they were able to, you know, they were able to work together in, in the end, at the, in the later days of, this, of the Scottsboro boys, that when, when things were finally, they it got to the Supreme Court and things were finally rolling out. And these two organizations uh, could work together um, because they had different challenges. And yet the goal that they were seeking, uh, whatever path they were choosing to get there, was the same goal. Um, Even to this day, sometimes when we hear about the Scottsboro Boys, if we're allowed to hear about the role of the Communist Party, there's this tendency by some more I don't know, liberal or, or centrist commentators to sort of portray the communists as these sort of outside meddling agitators who had their own agenda and, and were just sort of using this gospel voice. But they were picked to be the defense by the families themselves who, who met with mm -hmm. them and trusted them, which sort of makes me think we hear a lot today still about, about outside agitators as this sort of trope that 
you know, people would be happy with police brutality if it wasn't for, you know, outside agitation. You're laughing because it's absurd, I know. Uh, what can we learn from this time period? I, I assume the communists were called outside agitators in a way that- Oh, we, absolutely, absolutely. What can we learn about the trope of the outside agitator? And, and, and is, how do we deal with it? Well, it, it, it comes from it simply that everything is just fine in this society. It's just fine with just the way we like it. And these people coming in and telling us how to live our lives uh, is the problem. The problem is not that you've got this crushing poverty, that you've got this white supremacy that is, you know, on the neck of especially young black men, even in those days. So they, they're identified as, number one, meddling, number two, pushing themselves where they don't belong, number three, foreign in the sense that they don't, they're not following any kind of a Christian uh, agenda, they're not Christian, they're uh, atheist, whatever, um, and so they're, you know, the quintessential outsider. And I think rather than getting panicky over that, one of the brilliant um, ways the party worked was that, yeah, fine, okay. But they would work with uh, the black community that needed the help. They would organize, help the sharecroppers uh, especially. And you know, the life of a sharecropper was absolutely miserable. It was one step up from slavery. It was economic slavery. And they needed this union, although in the end it, it wasn't very successful, but they needed something to pull them up out of, out of poverty. And when you're in that situation, many times you don't care who, where the help is coming from or what they're doing. So the, the sharecroppers were able to work with these, with these outsiders. Um, I think they, the party, the party members, the comrades heard it for so long that after a while it, it didn't even bother them. There, there was no way of countering it other than working through it. It's interesting because the flip side of this is that early on the communist party of Alabama, it was people who had come from the North like yeah. you mentioned, they had a lot of cultural differences. By the end, the party is majority African-American. On the left today, or in social justice movements, especially with struggles around racial oppression and things like that, I think a lot of people wonder what's the correct role for activists who are in solidarity with those struggles, but also you know, don't want to parachute in and you know, tell people, oh, did you know you're oppressed? Here's how you fight it. I, I think people can sometimes take some very, very extreme positions on, on both ends of the spectrum. But, but what's the lesson to be taken away from, from the communist experience in how should people who are in solidarity with oppressed communities uh, view themselves in relationship to their struggle? Well, I think what the, what the communists did um, at least in 1929, was they took from the stance from the um, the Communist Party itself, the International Communist Party itself, this whole idea of um, populations um, figuring out what it was they needed and working with them in a way, and I mean, you heard Angelo Herndon say it, that they were, they felt that they were in the struggle with them. Not that they were some, some outside force that came that was gonna take over and show them, show them how to do it. I mean, that was one of the problems in SNCC. Uh, you know, they felt that the whites from um, the North were coming down, taking it over, telling them how to run the uh, rexograph machines or whatever. But um, 
for some reason, whatever the party had in 1929, 1930, through the depression, it seems that in many places, not only in the South, but in the Midwest with the farmers, they were able to ease into a community and work with people and really have the patience to not knock them aside and let, say, let me do this and then you come in and then we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to the end faster. So it's, it's not a, a how-to in many ways. It's, it's an approach. It's, a, 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 it's patience. It's um, having the ability to think things through and include other people. And it takes time and it uh, doesn't move as fast as we often like it. And I don't know, maybe people are more, I don't know, I, I just don't know. Um, so returning to what seems to be the topic of the night, religion in the South, uh, Jarrett has asked, was the prosperity gospel a thing back in the 1930s? And if so, did that hamper any collaboration with religious communities? It seems like that would have been difficult to work around. Gospel of prosperity, people who are not familiar with, is this belief that wealth is a reward from from God himself. I guess it could be herself too, but I think usually prosperity gospel uh, communities are quite patriarchal. Um, and that, you know, therefore wealth is a material, is a, is a religious blessing for having lived a, a righteous life. Oh yes, that, that definitely played in. Like, and as you said, with the planters, they saw their prosperity as, as God's uh, shining on them that you know it was, it was very simple that um, blacks were where they were because that's where God wanted them to be um, so it but you know I, I always suspected that was just an excuse um, talk about the flexibility of the image of Jesus there's flexibility in a lot of things you can look right at it and call it something else um, you have uh, religious people who are wealthy, who will feel uh, that they have a, a, um, a charge to use some of that wealth for good purposes and help people out. And, and then you have a, a, the planter class that was, it was, they were very, very uh, difficult. And they, they saw this as part of the religious uh, their religious belief that uh, God made himself very clear. Um, and that prosperity was a sign that they were doing something right. It's funny how people who are lording over others just so happen to discover the one of the immutable uh, cosmic laws of the religious world is that they were destined to do so by God. It's quite a coincidence for them to find that out. Uh, Sam has a question that I've been wondering myself. He mentions that was the FBI with the second FBI second headquarters slated to open in Huntsville February next year? I'm wondering if you could speak about any conflict or surveillance of the Communist Party of Alabama and how they handled those interactions. And I just want to say we did an entire night school on the history of FBI surveillance of the left, which I led because that is a topic I write about professionally. Um, so if you're interested in that one, you should check it out on our night school webpage. Uh, but Mary, what, what kind of surveillance did the communists in Alabama face? Well, this particular group, these this young group from 1929, they had they were constantly moving. Uh, they would uh, have an apartment sometimes for a month or two, and then just keep moving because it was more local uh, surveillance. It was you know the sheriff, the uh, uh, and it. They were constantly being um, followed. They were definitely um, charged with, um, I'm trying to think of the, um, I, I can't think of the word, where you're arrested because you can't prove that you're, uh, you have a job. Vagrancy. That's it and thrown into jail. And you can do that every 10 days. You can, and many of the uh, young uh, men, especially, were constantly being arrested and thrown into jail uh, on that charge. And 
the newspaper is a good, uh, uh, the uh, Southern worker, the, in Birmingham and in Chattanooga, they were looking for the presses, they were looking for the editor um, of the uh, communist worker. And uh, it, it just about drove them crazy because it had a Birmingham, uh, it, it said the paper was published in Birmingham. It was not, it was published in Chattanooga. And the sheriff was constantly with his deputies trying to find the editor. He wanted to put him in jail. And he was sitting up there in, in Chattanooga getting the paper out. So um, it was a kind of not sophisticated surveillance. It was just meant to get them agitated enough that maybe they would go home or maybe they'd be frightened enough to, to get out of there and they wouldn't be re replaced. Um, the surveillance became more and more sophisticated as time went on, certainly. Uh, but they faced a, a kind of, um, you know, just the fact that they, they weren't welcome and uh, they needed to go. So um, anyone has any last questions, please put them in the question and answer box and I will ask them. Uh, Sarah wants to know if you think the concept of working class versus the ruling class is still applicable today. I can just say on behalf of DSA, we certainly think it still is, but I, I wonder what your answer is, Mary. Oh, I think it, it is, it is, but I think definitions may, may be different of, uh, of ruling class and working class. Um, working class, I think um, more people who define themselves as working class maybe 30, 40 years ago uh, would have considered themselves in a, in a lower class. I think the, the, what defines the class is shift. And I think ruling class um, has also expanded um, the concept of who is in the ruling class and what it does and, and um, what its function is. Um, maybe wrong, but I do have a, a sense that um, each of those classes have expanded by their own, by their own definition. So if anyone has any last questions, please enter them in the question and answer box. And if not, Mary, I, I think maybe I'll end with, in, in what ways did the work of the Communist Party in the South, in Alabama, during this time period, pre-configure the work of the civil rights movement of the 60s and late 50s that people might be more familiar with? I think the the whole uh, idea of, I think the, when I talked about um, the work of SNCC and Oh, I lost it. But the and SNCC is the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee for people who don't know that acronym. They worked with the community in the way that the Communist Party did. I think there was a direct connection between the student nonviolent coordinating committee in the way that they uh, entered black communities in the South and worked with them. Uh, the Alabama um, uh, Black Panthers came out of uh, a later SNCC uh, community and they worked up until the 1960s with Alabama farmers trying to get them uh, and sharecroppers trying to get uh, economic justice for them. I think the the issues were very similar, but more important, the strategies were very similar. That the the later um, um, movements um, took on uh, certainly the energy and. Um, 
I don't know, the determination uh, of working to make a better America. Any final thoughts for us on this Wednesday evening in the midst of a pandemic and economic collapse and uh, national uprising against racial injustice and police brutality? I can throw in climate apocalypse as well, but I thought that was enough <laughs> for us to handle it one time. Any, any final thoughts for the, for the viewers at home? Final thoughts? I think that if, if we can retain energy like this group gave us, I mean, I've, I've been so impressed by what they put up with and still kept going. If we cannot lose our um, ability to think beyond the pandemic um, and to, to keep a sense of hope that there is something in this country that always seems to pull ahead a bit, even though there's this great wind, the great force that keeps pulling us back, keeps recycling this, these issues over and over again. I think that keeping um, some degree of hope will help. And I think realistically, if we don't get it together this time, um, what, would, what would be the next step? Where would we go from here? Um, That's a sobering thought. It is a sobering thought. How many times are we gonna walk down this road? And how close are we gonna continually inch along and then be thrown back 20, 30 years? Um, I saw some, some one of the, uh, uh, I think it was a basketball player on television. He said, what black basketball player? And he looked at the camera, he said, what more can we do? What is the next thing? What is the last thing that we can do that we haven't done before to make it clear? And that chilled me uh, to the bone. So on the one hand, I'm trying to remain hopeful. On the other hand, you know, time may in fact be running out uh, with all these uh, cycles of uh, hate that we've gone through. So on that terribly <laughs> depressing note, I leave you and I thank you so much for the invitation. And Eric, thank you so much for joining us. The book is Red, Black, White, The Alabama Communist Party. I highly, it's disappearing into my virtual background, but I highly recommend it. Uh, and I would say that Democratic Socialists of America are active in communities all over the country. Here in DC, we've been very active in support for tenants and tenant rights, as well as working to defund the police and against police brutality. Uh, David, I know you gave announcements about future events while we had our brief uh, unscheduled intermission, but is there anything else we need to tell the folks at home about? I don't know if there are any Yes, other I was about. muted, but now I'm here. Oh. So I'm going to show you some ways, if you're in DC, there's some ways that you can get involved here. Hold on. Anyway, so um, if you want to become a Metro DC DSA member, and learn more about how you can get plugged in, you can do so at the new member site right there. Um, you can contact the night school team at political education at mdcdsa.org. You can find us on Twitter at, at night school underscore DC. And if you're on our chapter Slack, you can find us at political dash education. So we have past events on the Metro DC DSA YouTube channel. Where this is being streamed right now. Um, and you can also find more events, um, videos, plus resources like reading lists and things from other um, events on the Night School website, which is mdcdsa.org slash night school. Um, we do have nothing else firmly scheduled yet, but we are gonna have events coming up on the Brazil um, landless workers movement, um, future events on public banking, um, socialism, um, Marxism, and probably some others, but uh, nothing, we, hopefully we will be announcing a whole bunch of things soon. And then if anyone from uh, one of our Alabama friends has anything we should mention, uh, let me know. I don't, I don't see anything. So I guess I will end it. Thank you everyone for joining us. The video of this will be online. Thank you so much for doing this, Mary. It's always a pleasure to do this. Thank you.